out of the blue, I started sweating like profusely from head to toe. I was dizzy and I got really nauseous. And the next thing I knew, I just remember getting off the phone as quickly as I could. And I think I lost consciousness. Oh my goodness. I was on my couch, um, just, just laying on the couch. And I came to probably maybe in a minute or so. And I just knew that I was having a heart attack. On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. And welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'd like to welcome Sherry Shrallow. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Now, you have a very interesting story. And I think one that maybe some can relate to. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened about 10 years ago? Sure. So 10 years ago, I was 56 years old. And I was a really, I thought, healthy woman. I exercised like at least five times a week, strenuous exercise. I did everything, biking, running, walking, kayaking, you name it, I did it. And I was um, working in my psychotherapy office where I was seeing my patients and I had had lunch and I was on the phone with um, one of the, my uh, a patient's father and all of a sudden, just out of the blue, I started sweating like profusely from head to toe. I was dizzy and I got really nauseous. And the next thing I knew, I just remember getting off the phone as quickly as I could, and I think I lost consciousness. Oh my goodness. I was on my couch, um, just, just laying on the couch, and I came to probably maybe in a minute or so, and I just knew that I was having a heart attack. Hmm. So that's how it started. And what happened after that? How did you get help. Yeah, so I did probably a stupid thing. I, I should have called 911 myself, but I decided to call my husband who was at work. Uh, we were living down in Houston, Texas at the time. And luckily he answered the phone, which was a miracle in itself. Mm. And I just said to him, honey, I, I think I'm having a heart attack. Call 911. So he did. And they arrived really quickly. I mean, I know that um, I was lying on the floor at that point because I had to crawl over to the door to unlock it because it was locked and they came in and he took one look at me the paramedic and he goes you look really pasty I think you're having a heart attack wow oh my goodness did you ever have chest pain or jaw pain arm pain did you have any of those classical symptoms nothing not at all wow what about back pain nothing it was Amazing. just the things I mentioned. The only other thing that, you know, looking back on sort of what something I might have noticed was I had some fatigue. Mm. Uh, I was a runner at that time and I had been on a trip with my sister and I went out for my regular run and I was really like tired and I sort of stopped before I was done, which was unusual for me. Mm. So interesting. And this is a great story in educating people that women oftentimes have unusual symptoms or no That's symptoms right. other than what you're describing, acute onset of fatigue and, you know, this profuse sweating and not feeling well, nauseous, amazing. So right. what happened? So you were taken to the hospital and? Yeah, they got me there in about five minutes and they wheel me into the uh, ER and this cardiologist looks at me and he says, we think you're having a heart attack. And I just remember looking at this stranger and saying, please don't let me die. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, don't worry, I won't. Hmm. But uh, that promise was almost broken when they got so, me up to the cath lab. So tell us the uh, serious adventure you had in the cath lab. Yeah, so they get me in there and of course they want to send that catheter up my arteries to see what's happening. And lo and behold, I do have a 99% right blocked coronary artery. My right artery is totally blocked. Mm. So I chose, unfortunately, that very moment when that catheter was in my right coronary artery to vomit. Now, I was not awake for this, but I, I vomited because I had had lunch before this happened. Mm. 
Mm. And mind you, I haven't thrown up since fifth grade because I have a real aversion to it. So I'm sort of glad I wasn't awake for that. <laughs> but uh, when they did that, uh, that's when the real trouble started because they dissected my aorta accidentally. Oh my God. Yeah, so that's not a good thing. You know, you die from that kind of a thing. So the surgeon came running past my husband. He was called in quickly and told him to hurry up and gather our family. And nobody was in Texas. We didn't have family there because he gave me about a 20% chance of surviving that day. Wow. So you, something, but beyond dissecting the aorta, what happened? Like what was the, some things happened. Like you literally stopped living for what three times you coded three times i coded right mm. and they were doing um, a bypass surgery as well oh wow because uh, they obviously it was an emergency situation they didn't have time to fiddle around with you know doing any kind of stents they couldn't at that point mm. so i'm just really fortunate to be here today and to be alive wow amazing so um tell us a little bit about what happened after after that, when you woke up and you heard or was aware of what happened, what was going through your mind? Well, it was a long time before I knew what was happening because I was in the intensive care unit for, I think it was about a week. Mm -hmm. And they kept my chest open and put me on a, a now I'll see if I get this right, it's called the right ventricle assist device mm -hmm. because I couldn't, they thought my heart was way too weak to, uh, to work on its own. So I literally had an open, chest wound so that they could keep me connected to the machine. Oh and the surgeon told my husband, he said, she's going to have to be on this for at least five days and she's going to need a pacemaker if she makes it through. Well, none of that was true. I was oh. so fit that I came off of that dog bomb thing in two days. They were able to sew me back up oh, wow. and I never needed a pacemaker. Fantastic. Did you have heart failure afterwards? Did you say, did they tell you you have a, a lower ejection infraction? Um, a little bit, but it's, you know, it was not something that um, caused me any symptoms of any kind. I really, I did pretty well, but I, I did well after I made some big major changes in my life. And I have to tell you that going into the hospital and remembering what they were feeding me, Mm -hmm. And in the rehabilitation center, I was out of my home for a month in these places. Mm -hmm. And every day they would bring me meat, they would bring me eggs, and they would say, you need to eat this protein. It's important. And I knew without having been educated at that point that something was terribly wrong here. Right. Something was off. And so I talked to the dietitian, and she said, well, I can get you some fish. And so I figured, well, that might be a little better. So at that point, they would bring that in. But, you know, mm -hmm. when you have this kind of major surgery, one of the side effects, at least for me, was I had no appetite mm -hmm. for weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. Part of it may have been I was so depressed from what happened. Sure. But I think the other part was that I just, I couldn't eat. I wasn't hungry at all. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about your diet prior to the heart attack? I mean, exactly... Sure kind of what you were eating because you thought you were eating a healthy diet, correct? I did. So, you know, I was eating that Mediterranean style diet. Mm. So I would use things like olive oil. We would eat fish and chicken. My husband had already given up meat like 20 years ago. So we didn't really have meat in the house, but those kinds of things. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of fruits and vegetables. Wow. And I really thought that I was doing myself a favor. Were you diagnosed with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, anything at all? Yeah, I had, you know, slightly elevated blood pressure and cholesterol. My cholesterol um, at the time of my heart attack was 175, the total on, cholesterol. On medications or off medications? Um, on medication, but just a teeny little bit. And blood pressure, I don't think I was on any medication for blood pressure at that time. Mm, wow. So you were exercising daily or five days a week. Mm -hmm. eating what you thought a healthy diet, but you'd still had high cholesterol, needing medication, potentially high blood pressure medications. Right. So that, that tells people something, right? Just because you're on a pill doesn't mean you're safe. And yeah. under 200, which they consider normal, is not good. So this is really interesting. So tell yeah. us then, how did you proceed? So you're in rehab, you're not doing well with the food, you have no appetite, and you get to go home. What happens? 
So I get home and, you know, I, I'm just so weak. I've never been so weak in my life. So I basically sat in a chair all day long and read books when my husband finally went back to work. And um, I decided that, you know, I needed to educate myself a little bit more on the subject of heart disease and prevention and reversal. So I was very fortunate that my sister at the time worked as a nurse practitioner at the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. And she knew Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn personally. Wow. Esselstyn, excuse me. He does, it's not Esselstyn. It's called Messy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I got that book about two months after being home, read it in one day, mm. and I said, oh my God, nobody told me this. Not right. one doctor, not one dietitian. The only thing my cardiologist told me was, in terms of my diet, he said, oh, just watch your sodium, but you can eat what you've been eating. It's fine. Wow. So when I went for my first follow-up visit with him, I come with my book in hand. Right. He had never heard of it. So he flips through the pages and he goes, oh, this is interesting. So I knew then and there that this was not someone that I could call my doctor anymore. I had to right. find someone who knew about this and who would treat me with the food. And who was that? Medicines, right? Not all these medications. Right. And who did you find? So it took a while. So I saw another cardiologist, a female cardiologist, who was the head of cardiology at the really big hospital in Houston, Texas. And she was very nice, but she was not on the same page with me. She was still prescribing that her patients eat a lot of fish and olive oil. Mm -hmm. So then I had to search again. So I found a doctor in Houston. His name is Baxter Montgomery. Yes, yeah, excellent. And I was home. <laughs> excellent. So what did Dr. Montgomery say to you on your first visit? Well, he said I was doing all the right things awesome. and that we were going to work together and that we were able to get me off of some of these heavy duty heart medications that I had been told I had to be on for life. Wow. And I don't remember the names of them, but one was to slow the heart rate down. Mm -hmm. A beta blocker. Uh, yeah. And another one. And, and I, he said, no, you don't have to stay on those. Let's just see how you do. And I did fine without them. Amazing. Amazing. So how many times did you have to see Dr. Montgomery? So I saw him, you know, as my cardiologist, maybe, oh, how often was it? At the beginning maybe every month or so. And then it wasn't, you know, not too long where we stretched it out a little more because I was doing fine. Wow. And when's the last time you saw Dr. Montgomery? So we moved from Texas, um, let's see, back in 2015, we came back to Chicago. Okay. So we moved back here. So I had to find new doctors when we came back here. I see. Did you happen to find a new plant-based doctor there? Uh, I have one now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ashwani Garg is my internist. He's amazing. Wonderful. And he is a lifestyle medicine physician, as you know. Uh -huh. And just, uh, just a breath of fresh air. You know, when I went to see him, I just said, I've never had such a productive visit with a doctor, <laughs> ever. Fantastic. It's helpful, though, too, when the patient and the doctor are on the same page. Of course. That makes it very easy to move forward. Right. <laughs> so as far as symptoms, I mean, so you recover. How long did it take you oh. to kind of get back to your normal state of affairs? It was a long time. So this mm -hmm. happened in November, and I didn't go back to work until February wow. to see my patients. And I did it part-time, and I was exhausted. Wow. So it took a full nine months for me to go back to full-time work. Oh, wow. Okay, and so how about exercise and that type of thing? Yes, I, I did that. So when I was in um, the rehabilitation program that I went to after I was discharged from the hospital, um, I went there three times a week to start with mm -hmm. and did things, you know, I was on the treadmill, you know, I had been a runner, so I could, I tried to, you know, increase my speed and do all that kind of thing, but I was very weak, so I had to be... Mm -hmm sort of cautious and take it slowly. So it was more walking than anything else to start with. Okay, very good. And some weights, they did weights, you know, at the end of the class, we do some light weights. Okay, so now did you have a weight issue? Were you always thin? No weight issue. I was always of a normal weight. 
Uh, nope, never had a weight issue. Maybe. So you never know what's going on on the inside, do you? No, no, <laughs> you don't. Um, so ex can you explain a little bit on a, in a, well, we're going to have a few questions. So tell us in a day, what do you eat now okay. um, that you would consider, you know, your life-saving prescription? Yeah, so my diet is uh, it's really easy. You know, I teach a lot of cooking classes, so I have a gazillion recipes, but I like to mm. keep it simple. So every morning I wake up to steel cut oats mm -hmm. with my homemade almond milk that I cook it in. Nice. And I put blueberries in it, turmeric, cinnamon, and pepper. Wow, very good. The fantastic anti-inflammatory. That's right. And then I also, for the blood pressure, I drink hibiscus tea every morning. Mm. So that's my breakfast every day. And if I don't have it, I miss it. So. Oh, so then what is lunch and dinner for you? Yeah, so lunch is like today, I made a beautiful, what we call my garbage salad, where you throw everything but the kitchen sink in. So it has beans, peas, all the vegetables, a few raisins. And then I have this wonderful uh, balsamic vinegar that I buy from a store called the Olive Tap, which is the best. It's oh. really a thick uh, balsamic vinegar. And we just drizzle that on top. So that was lunch. And then we, uh, my husband and I split a real big orange. And that's it. Wow. And if it's wow. not a salad, I always make soup every week that lasts me for the whole week. Fantastic. Usually lentil soup. Wow. So soup, salads, oatmeal, veggies, fruits. Excellent. Yeah. And you've been oil free since then as well. I have. Okay. What do you do when you travel? Well, we don't like to travel that much anymore because it's so difficult. So mm -hmm. what we do is we've come up with sort of, I think, an ingenious way to have fun on vacation. We met, um, a couple, like three other couples at, at a conference on plant-based nutrition that we just clicked with. So every year we rent a house somewhere in a nice part of the country. This year we're supposed to go in October out to Scottsdale and we spend the week cooking together. We take turns, we go grocery shopping and we have fun together. So that's what we do. Um, that's fantastic. So you've really built uh, at least a traveling community, but tell us a little bit about your activities in Chicago. Yeah, I'm a busy person here. <laughs> so, you know, I started a cooking class um, six years ago that's called Lincolnshire Vegan No Oil Cooking Club. And we have about 450 members of the club. Wow. And so what I did, I did this for five years. Uh, every month we came to my house and I could have like 18 people at a time. And we would, we would have a cooking class and then we would sit and we would eat together and we would talk together. So it became a beautiful, tight-knit community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I couldn't have 450 people at my house, so we would post the recipes the next day on the site. It was a meetup site. And then people could try them. Wow. And so I took that model a little further because I'm on the board of a new nonprofit here called Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. Mm -hmm. It was founded by Stephen Long, Dr. Stephen Long, that you know, a cardiologist mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And we have one goal and one goal only, and that is to change the way Americans eat to prevent the spread of these diseases that don't have to exist, like heart right. disease and diabetes, right. autoimmune diseases, some cancers, all of that. So we trained um, 20 people last year to be what we call PBNM cooking coaches. Mm -hmm. So they do what I've been doing for five years now. Now I'm more as an administrator. I'm not teaching. I'm helping them get started. So we're starting to see classes pop up in all parts of Chicago, which is really oh, nice. That's amazing. So now we're in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit, is there, are you guys kind of doing virtual stuff or how do yes. you feel about what, what are you doing to help that move along still? Yeah, so we just had a meeting last week about this. And so we decided we're going to do free cooking classes online. So I did my first one yesterday. I called it breakfast for dinner. Mm -hmm. And so we made a tofu scramble and we made uh, Mary McDougall's fluffy pancakes. Nice. And then um, just for children, I made this sort of fruit art, which was, you know, I'm no artist, believe me. <laughs> it was supposed to look like a turkey. I think it did, sort of. <laughs> 
<laughs> Not a turkey we would eat, but it was all made out of fruit. It was sort of cute. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so your husband's on board with you, obviously, completely. He is so on board. You know, when I told him what I was going to do, he said, I'll do whatever it takes Aww. to help you get better. And he's, he's been perfect with it. Fantastic. And then do you have children? We do. We have three children. And any of them come on board with you guys? Oh, I wish. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, no, not a hundred percent. Okay. So, you know, I really feel though that I can't make anybody do anything. Right. I can only lead by example. So when we visit like my son in Ohio and his wife and my two grandchildren, they're very good about always having plant-based meals for us. I mean, they're great. It's mm -hmm. just not the way that they typically eat all the time. Amazing. But my grandson did call me during this uh, stressful time and everybody's home from school. And he said, Grandma, where's that recipe for your vegetable soup? I want my mom to make it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so they oh, made it. Yeah. That's, that's good. I mean, these young ones, that's ones you can really, really influence. Can right. you tell us a little bit about the testing afterwards? So you had some additional testing done and what were those results? Well, not much was done in terms of testing for almost nine years. Um, oh, wow. when, I start, when I started seeing um, Dr. Kim Williams, who now is my cardiologist here in Chicago. Yes. You know, at one of my visits, I think when it was like eight years into my, uh, to my recovery, um, I said, so I wonder what's happening inside of me. I wonder how the bypass is doing. Because I had heard that if you have bypass surgery that only lasts so long, you might have to have another one. And I also was curious how the aorta was holding up that they repaired. Wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that patch was still holding. Mm -hmm. So he goes, well, let's do a nuclear scan. So he sent me down there for that test. And I had some great news and some not great news. So the great news was that my right coronary artery that had been bypassed with that vein from my leg it was now doing all of the work again, supplying oxygen and nutrients to my heart, and the bypass was fired. It was no longer needed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was great news. That's fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that wasn't so great, the area where they repaired my aorta, mm. I have a teeny little bubble that Dr. Williams calls a pseudoaneurysm. Right. And so that is something that we've got to watch, and I'll have to repeat this nuclear test. It was suggested in one or two years. He said, let's wait two years. Mm. Because he knows I try my very best to keep my blood pressure very low. Right. And he knows how much I exercise. So that's what we'll have to do. Just watch it. Now, were there any, to, as far as abilities to go back to running? Or do you, is there any restrictions on the type of exercise you're able to do now? No restrictions on anything. Oh, fantastic. And I've become an avid pickleball player, which is really, really tough. Pickle, pickleball slug. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Um, now, as far as for people who, so you have lots of experience teaching, you've done this yourself, you have an amazing story, right? Coronary has opened itself back up. What do you tell people if they come to you and say, how do I even get started? What would be a good, um, a bit of advice for someone who's really contemplating changing their life because they heard your story? I tell them that, you know, change can be challenging mm. and that you have to be kind to yourself, but that any changes that you make, any small changes are a start. Mm. So I'll have people say, well, how about if I do it once a week? I say, perfect. Start on Mondays, do the meatless Monday thing. Mm -hmm. um, I always, you know, advise them of where they can find recipes. And I emphasize that this doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to spend all day in the kitchen like I do, because I like it. <laughs> but you can make things pretty easily. So I give them some examples, like, of what can I make for dinner? Because that's always the question. What do you eat if you don't have a piece of meat or chicken or fish on your plate? And I said, well, it's as simple as opening up a can of beans. And maybe getting some barbecue sauce and dribble a little bit on there, mix it in, have some fresh vegetables, 
have a sweet potato, <laughs> you know, it's really easy. A big salad, you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think people forget that they actually do eat plants. It's really kind of funny. It's like, right. Meat. I mean, you're, these, these are not foreign foods, right? <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> That's so funny. So it's interesting now that we, you know, just to bring back around to the pandemic stuff that's going on. I mean, so many of these viruses that cause these come from animals. So, and how we've changed how we raise animals over the course of, you know, a century or two really has affected them migrating their viruses to the human um, population and devastating effects. I mean, the measles, the common cold, the flu, coronavirus. Oh, yes. So, if anything else, that should be enough of a reason to stop eating animals. So, I and I so wish that one of the major networks would play Dr. Michael Greger's uh, video that he did seven years ago, where mm -hmm. he pretty much predicted completely what was going to happen. Actually, I think that was in 2006, wasn't it? I thought it was just seven years ago. Um, I, mean, I, I think on his thing, I think he said it was um, over a decade ago. Was it? Oh, that the, that's yeah, it was a fantastic, worms. it's a fantastic video. Really amazing. Um, yeah. Very informative. And uh, certainly some, some people, you know, some things for people to think about. But isn't it interesting that throughout this pandemic that have you ever heard anyone talk about this yet? And in any detail on any of the major networks or news stations? No, okay. of course not. Okay. There's never going to be anything. If anything, we can reach the individuals. The, it's not going to come from the top down. It's going to no. it's going to go from the bottom up. But that's the beauty of social media. You can share those posts and talk to people about it. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a it's a scary thing, which we just don't know where it's going to end yet. So hopefully, okay. uh, people are social distancing, washing your hands you know, taking good care of themselves, so. Right. Well, Miss Sherry, thank you so much for a beautiful interview. We really appreciate your time. You're so welcome. It's so nice to meet you. Yes, virtually at least, and maybe someday when we're not socially distancing, we can meet in person. Someday. <laughs> someday. But uh, thanks to everyone for listening, and um, just a reminder that we did launch our first plant-based telemedicine. Uh, it's called plantbasedtelehealth.com. Um, and we're very excited. So check it out and trying to cover the entire nation with plant-based doctors by the end of the year. So.